I could not sleep. And my internal narrative was way to go, loser, loser. Like I just laid in bed, like just so miserably hard on myself. Hi there, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. Like all of us, Patty Jenkins has had those nights when her brain just wouldn't turn off, when she couldn't shake the fear of failure. Patty is best known for directing the Wonder Woman movies. In fact, Patty is the first woman to direct a superhero franchise. Wonder Woman hit theaters in 2017. Twenty seventeen began with the largest single day protest in US history. Millions of women across the country marched to protest the election of Donald Trump. He'd take office twenty days later. It made for fertile ground to launch a Wonder Woman franchise. It became one of the highest grossing movies of the year. My daughter was only four when Wonder Woman hit theaters. Now she's ten. As I prepared for my chat with Patty, my daughter and I sat down to watch Wonder Woman together, as well as the sequel Patty directed, Wonder Woman 84. My kid fell in love, certainly with Gal Gadot, with Wonder Woman's origin story, and a little, I'm afraid, with Chris Pine. Look, there are still days when my daughter insists that I'm the least cool person to roam this planet. But there are other days, like when we watch Wonder Woman together, that makes us feel like we completely understand each other. We're connected. We're one. That is the power of movies. I'm your host, Ben Mankiewicz, and this is Talking Pictures, a podcast about movies, about memories, and about all the stuff that happens in between. Turner Classic Movies makes this podcast with the streaming service Max, where you can see some of the movies mentioned in this episode. My guest this week, Patty Jenkins. Before Wonder Woman, Patty directed Monster, a true crime movie that came before true crime stories were ubiquitous. Patty has also directed prestige television, dramas like The Killing, and comedies like Arrested Development. I interviewed her last fall in Santa Monica in her office, which felt more like a home. Her mom, Emily, was there. My mother is a super fan of yours, <laughs> and I am too, but my mother lives and breathes uh, classic films, and uh, so this was a big deal. Clearly, Patty was using her mother to soften me up. It worked. Before she worked in movies, Patty was a first AC, or assistant camera, on music videos, shooting with A-plus level stars like Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Wu-Tang Clan. Do you think that dealing with such enormous stars with mega wattage talent and star presence, you think that helped you figure out how you deal with big movie stars on a on a set? It definitely humanized everyone. Like I've been, or I'll put it this way. By the time I made Monster, people were surprised at how comfortable I was on set. So I know that this is, I know what we're doing here. We're a crew. I've been on thousands of sets by that right. time. And I've only been on set since I was 19 years, 18 years old. And so that's the only job I had done. So it definitely like seeing Michael Jackson in particular, like being behind the scenes with Michael Jackson and he's a human being and he's struggling and he has needs and he's, that was one of the most incredible jobs I ever did. What, what video was that? It was uh, Earth Song. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the craziest story because they, he, he wanted no one to be watching him as he performed. So they, we were up in a field up in New York and um, like they had- Upstate? Upstate New York. Yeah, yeah. And they had built a, like a 30 foot white psych wall so that, the whole crew was behind it and only Michael was on the other side about three feet from the wall. And the only thing they couldn't figure out how to do was pull focus from right. the other side. Right. So they put me on the other side. So he was as close as we are right now. And he walked out and he was like folded up like a fan, this guy, like so his energy so closed in. And the second the song started, it was as if you were hit by a wave of energy of the biggest power you've ever felt, I could barely pull focus. It was what what came out of this person right before my eyes was so stunning. So 
Well, yeah. It was something. Yeah. And so back to your original question, I think when you've had, when you've worked with so much talent like that for so long, you definitely, and by the way, I'm in New York. I have friends blowing up and getting famous too, like normal people that I know. So it had demystified so many of my friends are artists and so many of them had made it that I, I definitely think it was demystified. I've never seen actors as an other. They're just my friends who were making something together. Um, so you were making, I imagine, a pretty good living when you're working as a as a first AC on videos and a, a second on commercials and you're focus pulling, but you're constantly getting hired. You're going from job constantly. to job. Yeah. You're doing all right. I was doing great. I was making tons of money. I was learning a lot. And then I, I got to the point where when I was 28, where I kept having the dream that I was going to make a movie on the side. And then I realized I can't get out of this circle because, because I can't stop working long enough to do it. And I can't not work. And so then I saw my friends who were, who had, uh, you know, who had never gotten a job and just and had some sort of support system to have them just not have a job, who just said, I'm a director or I'm an actor, and they were making it. And so I was like, I have to make my own door. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna take out student loans and go to AFI because it's it was on the Michael Jackson job actually that the DP said to me there, I said, I don't wanna go to film school because I already know so much. And he said, there is a film school where you can go just as a director and told me about AFI. And, um, and, and so I applied to AFI and when I got in, I said, okay, I've got two, two years to make it or else I'm going to have to go back to ACing. And for people who don't know, AFI, American Film Institute, and they, but they have a film school. Yeah. Right. But it's super small. It's super small. How many, they let in, I mean. I think, like, I, I think it was 10 directors. Yeah. Like a year. It was really, right? yeah. yeah. And it's a, how long program? Two years. Two year program. Um, that's got to be a somewhat difficult decision to give up a lucrative career. Super hard. Yeah. I'll always remember because I also I also was the happiest I have, was ever in my life in New York City. So I remember, I'll always remember a moment of sitting in my closet on the Upper West Side, staring at my apartment and thinking, I cannot believe I am doing this. Like I, I got, this is such a good life. I was making so much money living on the Upper West Side having so much fun. And I was like, are you serious? It was as if I was watching myself from the outside. Cause I like was you, like, you're serious, I guess. Like this is a, like, you I mean, part of you was saying you're being it. This is foolish. Yeah. You, this is good. You've made it. This You've is made it. I was right. like, just get married and move to the Island and become a cinematographer. No, I was like, I wanted to make my films. And so I was watching myself from the outside saying, I guess this is what you're going to do, which continues to happen throughout my career. Patty's first feature was based on a real-life serial killer, Aileen Warnos. Female serial killers are rare. Warnos was a sex worker who claimed she was repeatedly raped by her clients. Starting in 1989, after more than a decade working as a prostitute, Warnos began to kill her clients, her Johns. She robbed and murdered seven men. She was caught, convicted, and after 10 years on Florida's death row, the state executed Aileen Warnos in 2002. Patty's film came out a year later. She called it Monster and cast Charlize Theron as Warnos. It is a striking and memorable performance. Just a warning, this part of our talk is pretty graphic. Before we go there, here's a scene from the film. Charlize Theron is talking to Christina Ricci, playing the woman Aileen loves. Selby. Selby calls Aileen Lee. Yeah, we're gonna have a drink and we're gonna forget about all of this, all right? Cheers. Lee, this isn't funny. You don't know what's going on, Sal. I do. So if you want to keep your eyes shut to the whole world, then the least you can do is hear me out. No, I don't want to hear this, Lee. We can be as different as we want to be, but you can't kill people. Says who? How did Monster come to be? So Monster came because I'm a huge true crime buff. I've, I've, I watch, I've, I still watch a tremendous amount of it, which is finally acceptable. It was le much less acceptable. Do you want, what, what uh, what's your favorite true crime show? I mean, all of them, I stream them through my sleep. And so mm -hmm. they, it's like, you know, 48 hours, like every, I know them all. I've seen them all a thousand times. And so, um, I whatever. Love, I love 48 hours in 2020. You know, the show I hate, Dateline. Can't stand that show. So Dateline, there's I'm, I'm Dateline's. Kidding. My brother's on Dateline. Oh, is yeah, he? Oh, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 I love Dateline, Dateline Australia. Yeah. I end up watching a lot too. Strangely, yeah. but anyway, so uh, 
all this true crime, I at AFI Fest, I ended up going to the Kodak Connect program, and I was seated across a producer who, Brad Wyman, who just offhandedly told me that he that he was making these serial killer movies straight to video for Blockbuster, and I said. Oh, that's interesting. You should do one about Eileen Warnes. Because you'd watched a true crime show about her. Because her story had always stuck with me. First of all, I, I'd watched the real case unfold as it was happening in 89. And then the way she was talked about bothered me so much when people were like, she's a man-hating uh, lesbian. I was like, what? Right. You're looking at this person who's been, who's so damaged, like a feral animal backed into a corner, and you think she just loves this? Like... And so it was like the end of an of the most tragic opera. And I felt like that story, it, it always gnawed at me that it had been, never been told. And where she is not excused, but sympathetic. Yeah, where I'm right. like, how can you not, how can or at you least understood? Oh, by the way, I yeah. feel this way now. Right. I don't believe in psychopaths. I think that there's so maybe every once in a mil- million years, you know, one in a million, there's somebody who's born with a spectrum disorder that makes them inability to, the inability to fear, feel emotions. But when you go to prison and you know people who do horrific things, if you understood how horrific the things that they had experienced were, like Eileen, like Eileen didn't feel bad about murdering people. And when I would even talk about it in, in letters with her, she would say like, overkill, they say overkill, that guy died pretty quick. That wasn't that bad. I've been locked up in basements and raped for, you know, months. And so the level of torture that someone can go through or damage or whatever, I've always been endlessly fascinated as I watch. No, nope, that's not a psychopath. That's somebody with a line of damage that leads up to their inability to feel empathy anymore for anything less or, or at all. So anyway, so that I, I said to him, you should do, you should make a movie about Eileen Warnes. And he said, you should do it. You won't get anything else made. And thus began the journey of me starting to sit down and write. And the greatest gift about it was that I probably was frightened and commercial minded enough in that moment of my career that I would have never done something as daring as Make Monster and think that it could succeed so it was the first time in my life I've done something so completely honest. I was like, ah, you know what? I'm going to write a love story and frame it as a love story a la Midnight Cowboy. That's what I'm going to do, thinking no one would ever make it. So it was the first act of art in film that I've done that was just like, that's what I that's what I would do if I could make anything. And so I learned a lot from the fact that that's the thing that worked for me. And and then did you get Charlize? Who gets Charlize? Yeah, I wrote it for Charlize. I saw, I, so. But you didn't know her, right? I, mean, I didn't know her. Somewhere early on in writing it, because I was really racking my brain for who could do this, who could play this. And I saw her in Devil's Advocate. Mm-hmm, yeah, and it was such yeah. an unvain shot. And she was working so hard to sell, sell, you know, this moment and doing such a good job. And I thought she could do it. And so for me, it just, I was, I was curious who could hit both ends. I needed somebody who, when she held that gun, it could be terrifying and as, as powerful as Eileen really became, but also who was so vulnerable and loving, which Eileen was as well. Um, so my moment of crying and as my memory serves me correctly certainly the first probably the first time i saw it uh was scott wilson oh yeah look i've got the keys in the car there's my wallet just, just... no ma'am turn around no ma'am no no Get down. you don't have to do this Get down. you don't you really don't. I can't. You don't have to. You're just having a hard time. No, I can't let you live. Oh, oh God, my wife. My wife. My daughter's having a baby. Shut the oh, fuck God. up! Oh, God. Oh, God, Jesus. I'm sorry. My baby. You know, you put Scott Wilson in a movie, whether it's two minutes or 20 minutes, and your movie got better. 
Mm -hmm. right? Whatever you had, your TV show, your movie, your episode, anything got better, had Scott Wilson in it. And that was, a, to me, the most powerful moment yeah. in the film. That was one of the hardest scenes I've ever done in my life. Like, it really, still to this day, it goes down in history as, like, it was emotionally so hard. And it was so painful and ugly. It's the crime that haunted Eileen Warnes till the day she died. Really? In all of her letters that I end up inheriting 11 years of her letters, personal letters to She read. gave them to you like the night before the execution, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. And I I, 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 uh, I gave them back, but I, we read them all. And they, in it, she would always ask about that man's family. She, it was super clear that she knew she'd gone too far. All of these other guys, she could project onto them whatever she wanted because they were Johns. And there was a slippery slope of her getting a little more, you know, projecting a little too much onto them as, as it progressed. But that guy was trying to help her and she had to kill him for his car. And so she knew what she did. And he's just so good. Oh, he's so good. I mean, you just want to, he's a guy you always want to be on his side. And right? by the way, also a, a, an incredible moment of, 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 of learning as a director for me too, because it was very dark. We had tiny little grainy, you know, video assist at that time. And I couldn't see what he was doing. And I remember trying to direct him at one moment and saying like, I think you're really feeling scared. And he was, and him saying back to me, you're going to have to trust me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not until you see it projected that you're like, oh, oh. my God, <laughs> the, the smallness and yeah. subtlety of the performance is so beautiful and painful, like just so painful. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's one of the reasons why when Charlize won the Oscar, I just wept and was so happy for her and understood what that is. Because I think that people outside of Hollywood often don't realize you have to live it to a, of course you're not living it for real, but you have to go through it emotionally to find the honest emotion. Some part of Charlize has to decide to pull the trigger on Scott Wilson and understand it so deeply. And that's awful. You know, it's, it's really hard. And that movie monster in particular, you couldn't celebrate any of those actors enough for me because I saw what they had to go through to do it. Monster was a critical and commercial success. It grossed nearly 13 times its budget. As Patty said, Charlize Theron won the Best Actress Academy Award for playing Aileen Warnos. Oh, this has been such an incredible year. I can't believe this. Um, I, I don't have a lot of time. I have to thank my incredible director, Patty Jenkins. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Somehow, despite Monster's critical and financial success, Patty Jenkins ended up broke. How is it possible that you don't have a thousand offers? After I did Monster? have a thousand offers. Oh, I really did. All right. So the 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 struggle that I've had throughout my career is that the thousand offers that came were all not beautiful emotional things to me that I wanted to do, particularly not after Monster. I had such a profound experience making it that there were lots of money jobs. There were lots of faux art jobs. So give me, give me an example. I don't, I don't, I know people don't like talking about things they turn down. So I don't need just what kind of things are you getting offered it? What kind of things are you literally saying no to, even though you're what? Eight, like $80,000 in debt yeah. at this point. Yeah. Because why? Because mo one, Monster didn't really make any money. I got paid, what did I get? $60,000. That's it, to, to for the whole movie. And yeah. you didn't have any points in it or anything. No. Nope. just, that's it. I wasn't in the union. I got no residuals, nothing. Nothing. And, and, and Even so. Even though it made 80 something million dollars. <laughs> it made, and it was a budget of two. Yeah, one point so, five. One point five. Yeah. So, so at one point five million, it makes eighty million. You don't make any money from it. How do you turn down a, at least one big money offer? I don't know, because I thought it would. I mean, ruin, how do you not I thought, take I thought, at least I thought one it would money. ruin my career to make a movie if it wasn't great, and that I didn't believe in it. And I only know how to do things that I completely believe in. And I so the only wisdom I will say is that I saw the precipice of what was happening to so many people ahead of me where they make a shitty second movie and you're over. It's just, it's just, you're just, it's shut down. It's treated as a fluke. So that was in your head. Like big don't, time. do not take a big swing and miss don't, or I've lost don't all do, this. Don't do it. And, and also don't make it because you will have to succeed either. The only, Steve Perry was giving me great advice at this moment too. He's like, you can't work from this place. 
He's saying- if How did you know Steve Perry? So Steve, I had, I had written Don't Stop Believing into Monster. Mm. I had written the scene beat to beat, line to line, lined up exactly to that song. And everybody said, there's no way Journey doesn't give that song to anybody. Nobody's ever gotten it before. He's Steve Perry's a born-again Christian. He's hiding out in the woods. He doesn't talk to anybody. So Charlize and I penned like a passionate letter because I, I just was like, we have to get the song. We have to. And Steve literally showed up in the mixing stage the next day and was like, I love it. You can have it. We were like, what? What's <laughs> up with all this, the, the myth of you? And he was like, no, no, you can't. It's, it's, you're, you're understanding the song. He's like, I wrote the song about homeless people. And it's about desperate people. I just don't want to sell it for, it's not about the money. Right. I'm not going to sell it to Corona. It's wrong. Right. It's the wrong thing to do. And so he ended up, he was very much on the da hiding in, from the world at that moment. And he, you didn't know him. I didn't know him. So he ended up sitting behind me on the mixing stage and started just coming to work every day. And I remember this moment so clearly where I was very alone at this moment. Everybody's gone. And everybody's moved on to other projects. And I was fighting some creative battle. And he pulled me aside in the hallway and he goes, you got to stick with it. Don't give up. You're right. You're like the lead singer right now. You got to stay where you got it. You got it. And so he ended up becoming like the, the artist whisperer. I needed somebody who, who, and he ended up, I think, feeling invigorated by being back at work. So he came to work with me every day for four or five months. He ended up re-recording a bunch of stuff with me, fixing the, all kinds of things. He was like a hermit. He was, he was like, a total hermit at that yeah. time. But he, he and I had such a wonderful time with him being the, the artist who taught me, who was whispering in my ear all the time. You gotta, you gotta stay pure to yourself. You gotta do these things. And, and so he had said to me, if you make one for, for them and you, if you make one for them and you fail, you lost your two-time loser. If you make one for them and you succeed, you're still a loser because it you did, wasn't what you wanted to do. If you make one for you and you win, you're a two-time winner. If you make one for, for you and you fail, you still win because you got to make what you, what you wanted to make. And so that has been very important to me in my career. I actually don't know if I would be capable of doing it anyway. I think it's just, I didn't leave doing camera work to get another high paying job I don't want. That's not what I want. I want to make the movies I want to make. That's what I want to do. That's an incredible story, the yeah. Steve Perry story. Steve Perry story. And by the way, he's still one of my best friends. He's still, he's been an incredible part of my life and creatively is still uh, uh, someone I turn to for advice. But he, but it's also funny, he, sh he comes to set with me so often that it also was such a funny part of it where anytime I would be shooting something, I'd come in and approve like font for, you know, some episode of something. And people would be like, and I'd be like, I don't know. And I've spent so much time with Steve now. He'd be like, well, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't do a sans serif and I'm, nah, nah, whatever. people would be like, okay, that's great. Um, and then he'd walk out of the room and they'd go, I'm, I'm sorry, is that, is that Steve Perry from Journey? I'm like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot. I forgot. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. After Monster, it took 14 years before Patty made another feature film. She agreed to make a tentpole movie, a big budget film put out by a major studio. Tentpoles are supposed to generate enough money to make up for the less profitable pictures the studio puts out. Tentpoles cost more, but in most ways, they're actually less risky. They're often based on existing IP that has a built-in appeal to a wide audience. In Patty's case, the tentpole she signed on to make was Wonder Woman, part of the DC Comics franchise at Warner Brothers. I used to want to save the world. This beautiful place. But the closer you get, the more you see the great darkness within. Um, it took you a bit uh, to make that first feature. So, what we, and you said, thank God. Like, what, what did that mean? I did, and I say this to filmmakers all the time. Nobody's as hard on themselves as a 28-year-old who's not exactly the adult that they always wanted to be. Like, right. just the internal narrative. I could not sleep, and my internal narrative was, way to go, loser. Loser. Like, I just laid in bed, like, just so miserably hard on myself at, at that age. 
in retrospect, and I say this to people all the time, yes, it still took me a gap of time between Monster and, and, and Wonder Woman. But even all of the pilots I did, the amount of political savvy and adulthood and maturity that I needed to not lose my shit and just be able to handle those jobs, it t all those years were super helpful to getting there. And so if you make it too young, and I've seen this happen a bunch of times, and I've seen a bunch of people wash out of tent poles because they were too young and too new. And you're like, you can't pick a young writer and then put them in responsibility of being the CEO of a major corporation, which is what making a tent pole is like, you know, like you need to be approving dolls at the same time as you're doing this is the same time as you're, you know, it's like, so I think I'd rather make it a little bit later and be able to run with it and go forward than to hit it too young and then not be able to back it up. You told Bryce Dallas Howard in an interview, and this surprised me the when it came to how involved you were in the merchandising of everything. I mean, I was the CEO of Wonder Woman of the Wonder Woman movie out facing, of course there were other producers involved, but it's like, I, I, I had to be the one thinking really carefully about whether the color on that standee at Target really represented what the movie was going to end up. Cause I was the only one that knew because the movie wasn't done yet. So it's like, so you become, you, it, it's so imp like, you've got to be so responsible. And I've even heard about like younger directors being on those movies and like not communicating. I'm like, that's not going to work. People are going to start talking behind your back. You're going to get kicked off the thing. They're not going to have faith. You have to be uh, explaining to the studio what you're doing so that they understand, they feel confident. Do you like doing that? I don't care. I'll do anything. I'll like do whatever it takes. I'll fight any war f to make a great film. I No, it's a hassle to be so busy and to have to work so many hours. But really, that's all the more reason that I say that you have to love the movie that you're making and believe in it. And believe in it beyond being a, a co like. You should delegate some of this authority to Steve Perry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. But I look at, I, I look at, and I don't wanna judge other filmmakers for what they do. There are lots of filmmakers who make lots of things for different reasons. Sometimes there are filmmakers who are making things, in my opinion, for their own glory. I'm bored with that. Like, I don't know that, I don't know how much more I can feel. So it's like to be, and not many, but every once in a while, it's like, I'm gonna make this movie and it's gonna, I'm gonna be sealed as a genius in history. I'm like, yes, that's, I don't care what happens after I did. I really don't care. And so the truth is like to be able to fight a bigger battle and be able to say like, hey, let's try to save, send a message to every, all the children of the world. I'll do anything. I'll make any phone call. And so that's what makes it worth it. And that's why when I look at movies that are just a money job that would just be for my ego and not, again, it's not why d directors do them. Most directors believe in their films. But if I don't believe in it, then I, that's what I'm doing. So it makes it super easy to not do those movies. I'm like, because I really don't want to make a phone call to the CEO about a movie I don't even care about that I already got paid for, you know? Yeah. Like, then you're just living a shitty life. We need to take a quick break. When Talking Pictures returns, Patty Jenkins talks superheroes. In particular, one that seemed to be speaking directly to her. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed through that movie and it had a profound influence on me because I was Superman. Welcome back, and thanks for sticking around to hear the rest of my conversation with writer-director Patty Jenkins. I wanted to know how Patty survived financially during those 14 years between Monster and Wonder Woman, and then its sequel, Wonder Woman 1984. So what do you do to make money after Monster and you're turning down you know, mainstream, big money movies, right? I struggle to make money until Wonder Woman 84. I mean, honestly. So I, 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 I wrote, I, I had a few movies that I wanted to do. They didn't work out for a variety of reasons. And I kept directing TV to get by while, um, one movie in particular I tried to make for seven years and I couldn't get made, which in retrospect is mystifying to me now because it was, the lead character was a dog. Everybody in town told me you could not, it was a rated R movie starring a dog. And everybody in town said that could never succeed. Not like they thought Monster was gonna succeed, but in retrospect, I'm like, you'd think if so many of these filmmakers, like, like I've, 
you rolled the dice on your their second movie. It wasn't like you just rolled the dice. It was only like a $3 million budget, but nobody would. And so that, that, you know, I'm ponderous about now when I look at like so many of my peers, I'm like, yeah, Chris Nolan and I made our movies about the same time, but then everything else he decided to make somebody made and they w just wouldn't make my movies. They just wouldn't. They only wanted me to make their scripts until Wonder Woman, we, I aligned finally again. And Wonder Woman initially, you're involved and they're interested in you, but then they don't like your vision for it, right? No, it wasn't that. It was, it was, so I wanted to, I, it was one of the first things I told, the only thing in town I said, that's what I want to do, is I told Warner Brothers, I want to make Wonder Woman. Chris was making the Dark Knights at the time, so they just weren't doing that. So I, I talked to them off and on for the next eight years or whatever it was. And then when the, and then they, they actually came to me about it when I was pregnant with my son. And I was like, I can't do it now. Not, not right now, you know? Right. And then when it did come back, they already had a way that they wanted to do it, which I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't the right director. They'd for. made up their mind about a direction. And then you you'd be like, this is not, we just didn't sync up. Yeah. And then a year later, they ended up just ch changing their mind about what they wanted to do and remembered me. And so then finally it just, we, it came together. For people who, you know, a lot of people, there'll be a lot of movie people listening to this, but there'll be some just people who only like movies, right? You know, what are the different pressures between making a movie like Monster with a one and a half million dollar budget and a movie like Wonder Woman with a $150 million budget to say nothing of the second yeah. Wonder Woman, right? Like, So the, so the first one, if the first movie is obviously pretty desperate because it's your first movie, it's your one shot, you do want to make money back for the people putting money in to be seen as somebody worth rolling the dice on again. So all of the same things are there. So you feel the pressure of returning investment uh, for the investors, Always. even though you yourself are capped out at 60,000 bucks. For doesn't Monster. matter if but you want to get your next movie made, you have to be a good roll of the dice, you know? Yeah. So you want to be as artistic as you can be always and, and Trojan horse it if you need to, uh, you know, like more on the Wonder Woman's where I'm doing a very, to me, Wonder Woman was just as personal of a small story as monster. Exactly. But on the escalating pressures that come with Wonder Woman is Massive, a massive budget to return. But also the biggest one to me was this was her one shot, Wonder Woman. This is a character that I love and that has a huge fan base. And I'm now the one who needs to deliver the best. That this was, you know, I would even say to the studio, when, or when people would say to me, like, what's your spin on Wonder Woman? I'm like, it's not about that. I need to deliver the best Wonder Woman movie of all time. I'm going to follow my own heart into what's the most beautiful story to do that with, but I need to make a great Wonder Woman film for all of us. So even you feel responsibility, there may be a feeling of responsibility to Warner Brothers, there may be yep. a, a feeling of responsibility to uh, Gal Gadot, to, to Chris to Pine. To DC Comics, to, you. to Wonder Woman, but, to Linda Carter. But mostly, right, to Linda Carter, yep. but, but also to this abstract concept of Wonder Woman. Everybody that shows up in Halloween dressed up as Wonder Woman, that this is their one shot. Because if you swing and miss, there's never going to be another Wonder Woman nope. movie. Right. Nope. And you don't get new fans and you don't get a, a, the the younger generation doesn't get Wonder Woman. Right. You know, I thought about that all the time. Right. My daughter doesn't get Wonder Woman. She right. doesn't get Wonder right. Woman. Right. Superman changed my life. You know, I believe in the power of these movies. Seeing Superman a few months after my father died and seeing him lose two fathers in the first act of the movie and go on to be Superman. And I fucking that's a movie I sobbed through as a kid. Those things I can do, all those powers, and I couldn't even save him. Patty's dad, William Jenkins, Bill to his friends, was a U.S. Air Force officer and fighter pilot, earned a silver star in the Vietnam War. Then, back at home, his plane crashed during a combat training exercise. He was dead at 31. His daughter was seven. The dad stuff in Superman is what gets you. I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed through that movie, and it had a profound influence on me because I was Superman. I thought I was Superman. I could be Superman. I could find love. I could go on. It, so it just rocked my world as a kid. And so to, to be given the opportunity, and I still take this incredibly seriously, when, when and if I do a tentpole, 
you're always have an opportunity. The reason that I, I've loved them and will continue to do them, maybe, if even though I'd like to do smaller films too, is the opportunity to speak to the youth of tomorrow in metaphor through the power of story and that scale is so, how do you say no to that? Like, how do you not try to change the world little by little with storytelling when, when it's such a beautiful medium? So you're so organized. It, I'm curious whether the, 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 the mere pressure for a lot of us the pressure between making a one and a half million dollar movie like Monster and a hundred and fifty million dollar movie like Wonder Woman would just be the enormity of the stakes involved. But my impression of you from listening to interviews and reading is that you're so organized that you probably didn't behave that differently on Wonder Woman than you were on Monster or on The Killing or on Arrested Development. I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I I believe, and I try to teach this to my son now. Like you, you either be all in or don't, you know, like even when I fixed somebody's movie for them and then everybody left and I stayed and finished the movie for them because I, you got to be a finisher, like it, go all in because even because it's no fun to do half-assed, it's boring. Like it's boring. It's try for great, try for great at everything you do. So I feel very much the same. And even the, the, pre the pressures are different. The longevity of those Wonder Woman movies is insane. To be on the same movie for three years is crazy. But Does that um, mean you spent basically six years? Well, I guess it's still... Eight now, eight, cumulatively, eight yeah. On eight Wonder Woman. On Wonder Woman, <laughs> yeah. And so that's where it's like, that stuff is kind of mind-boggling to, to just be doing the same story for so, 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 so long. But beyond that, filmmaking is filmmaking. And... And even the stuff you don't know, it's like, there's always been stuff. I don't know how to get the dolly up to the top of the cliff either. So like, if I'm going to tell you how to do what I want in the special effects and somebody else is going to do it. It's really not that different. There's nothing that different. When Chris Nolan and you make your first movies at around the same time, and then he gets to make everything he brings up, and I know you're not knocking him in any way. Not at all. I love really Chris gifted. and look up to him so much. Right. But is there some sexism involved in that? I, now I think so. Now I definitely think so. I, it's funny, I escaped thinking about this for so long, and I think it was to my benefit that I just wasn't, I thought we were a lot further than we are in this world coming into this, particularly coming from New York, where I had friends, so many men and women and gay and every kind of friend. And so we thought we were through the, that. We thought this was past tense. Now, in retrospect, I think that We've just come to a place where they're where they're wanting to put women in the position of director, but still wanting to, wanting diverse people's ideas is still it's, we're not it's we're not, not there yet. It's not the same thing. And you, so, in retrospect, I look back and I'm like, at retrospect, I just kept saying, "Oh, it's funny. People keep telling me they love the script and it makes them cry, but no one will make my movie." In retrospect, I'm like, "Really? I made a hit movie and you wouldn't roll the dice on a three million dollar movie afterwards about it because it was about a dog and you didn't have faith in me, even though what I just did, everybody said wouldn't work either." Like, but but they just didn't believe in my ideas. They want they wanted me to do what they wanted me to do. So one thing you said that I wrote down, and I liked it so much because it just it you know especially for a a one a guy and two an idiot like me like it just you framed it incredibly effectively which was um, look I want to uh, make movies about women uh, that's cool and fun I don't want to make movies about being a woman yeah that's boring so boring right and, and I still get offered those a thousand trillion well, times a day what's the difference. The difference is people come to me all the time with, there's a story of a woman who was the first pilot to, I said, that movie's about gender, <laughs> right. Right? right? We already have seen the movie about the first pilot that did it. We've already seen the movie about bravery. So the only exceptional thing here is that it was a woman. And yes, that's a great story. And yes, that's a story worth telling. But I, I, I want to make great movies about the big world, you know? And I felt this way about Wonder Woman. I don't want Wonder Woman... Wonder Woman saves the world. Right. She's she's it's wonderful everything she stands for for women, but it shouldn't be that the men get to save the world and the women only save women and talk to women. It's like we want to save the world too. And so I just I came in as a very gender blind director wanting to make my own films. Um so 
was there more pressure on on, on Wonder Woman eighty four than 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 the original, or was it just the? Yeah, I think yeah, so. Yeah. I think there was more pressure because I felt like we were there was there was tons of scrutiny on us for how incredibly successful the movie had been, and then the movie even started to kind of pull a lot of eyes and people trying to advertise on the backs of of Wonder Woman of sort of saying, "Girl boss, click big," you know. We're here. We're number one. We're here to stay. We're taking over all of this kind of stuff. And so I could feel the heat on my back. And I was thinking, oh, they're going to be gunning for us soon. What goes up must come down. They're going to be gunning for us. So I sort of went into making Wonder Woman 84 going, ah, they're going to they're going to kick the shit out of us in one way or the other. And and the sad thing was, I think we would have made a gajillion trillion dollars because we were the number one selling DVD for like the next year and a half and blah, 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 blah. You mean if it hadn't come out in the middle of the pandemic? If it yeah, hadn't yeah. come out streaming because of the pandemic. Yeah. But the long story short is there was more pressure on it because I knew people were gunning for us. I should probably know the answer to this question, but I don't. So where are you now? On Are you done with Wonder Woman? Is that? Yeah. So for the time being, the- yeah. But you, I mean, but that, that's pro- a, easily forever. Yeah. For the time being and, and a good chance that for easily good. forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so somebody else would make the third movie. They'll probably be no, another. They're movie. not interested in doing any Wonder Woman for the next time being. Isn't that, that seems strange. It doesn't not. I, you know, listen, it's not an easy task. What, what's going on with DC, James Gunn and Peter Safran have to follow their own heart into yeah, their yeah. own plans. So I don't know why the why of like what of of what you know what they're planning on doing and why. And so I you know I I have sympathy for how what a what a big job it is and they have to follow their heart and do what they're interested in and and do what they're you know what they've got planned. At a Disney investor presentation in 2020, news broke that Patty would direct a movie in the Star Wars universe. It wouldn't be part of the main Star Wars franchise, but rather an original story called Rogue Squadron, focusing on elite fighter pilots. However, in 2022, there were reports that the Rogue Squadron project had been shelved. Do you do you see yourself making these, you know, grown up serious movies like Monster or, you know, and I don't know where you are on the Star Wars thing either. That's hard to, to, yeah. to follow, too. Or, or do you have a franchise in your future? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I am always, like I say, I'm always sort of outside of myself watching myself at the same time where I'm like, wow, I guess you're going to do this. I never thought I would find a home in tent poles. Like, that's not a thing I thought I would do. So I am so when I le- when I left Star Wars to do Wonder Woman 3 um and I went and I started working on that we talked about okay well maybe I'll come back to Star Wars after Wonder Woman 3. So we did a deal for that to happen. Started a deal, but I thought I was doing Wonder Woman 3. So when Wonder Woman 3 then went away, Lucasfilm and I were like, "Oh, we got to finish this deal." We finished the deal right as the strike was beginning. So I now owe a draft of Star Wars, and so we will see what happens there. You know, like who who knows? It's it's a it's a they have a hard job in front of them of what's the first movie they're going to do. They have other directors who have been working, but I am now, I, you know, I'm back on doing Rogue Squadron, and we'll see what happens. We need to develop, you know, get it to where we're both but super happy with it. Let's take all the contract stuff and all the stuff about other. But it, it, you would be happy to do a Star Wars movie. That would be exciting I, if it worked absolutely, out. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because of exactly what I'm saying, Star Wars is a beautiful, the, the the emotion of Star Wars and what it stands for is something so beautiful in this world and, and particularly what what it could, in a, in a moment that we're at right now where Star Wars was born out of World War II, right? It's born out of how oh, sure. do you Absolutely. how do you make a metaphor and and talk in metaphor. And, and George right? Lucas seeing... War pictures, exactly. Of, of fighter pilots, right? exactly. Yeah, right. And so, in that way, I've always wanted to make a fighter pilot movie. It's been a dream of mine. I always was in had a hard time with it because I'm in love with the jets of the '70s and and '80s, and that's not where the great dogfight stories are. And so, uh, you know, so 
Wonder, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Star Wars becomes a great playground for that. I think Star Wars, Wars is so beautiful. So yes, if I can do something beautiful and do something that that serves that audience and is great, I would love to do it. Of course, you know. But meanwhile, if I don't, I may make my dog movie. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say, <laughs> if you, I, I can offer you either one, you can't take them both, Star yeah. Wars or the dog. It's gonna be one or the other. Right. And then I have another idea, which is pretty big of my own. So it's like I, I have no idea what what path this will all take, you know? We're taking another quick break. Stick around, though, because when we come back, we'll put Patty Jenkins to the test with the Super 8. All right, uh, the Super 8, you ready? The yeah. first eight questions. All yes. right, here we go. Uh, your most memorable movie watching experience was? Reds. Uh, I was a little young. My mom, uh, is a film buff as you, as you now understand. And she took me to all kinds of movies. We had lived in Europe and we lived on college campuses and they were always showing all different kinds of movies. So I grew up watching incredibly diverse, independent international films and all these things. Reds, when it came to the theater, my mom took me. And I remember um, trying to identify, I, I didn't understand it completely. It's an interesting, you know, movie to be talking about right now in the context of everything that's going on in the world. But I remember leaving the theater, Cinema Twin, and sitting in the car. Where's and, the Cinema Twin? In Lawrence, Kansas. And it was raining. And there were raindrops on the window. And I felt something so complex. And I was turning in my head, Wow that is is making me feel very thoughtful about very deep subjects. And I th hadn't known that film could do that really, where I had seen other films and I either didn't understand them or I was feeling good or bad or I liked it or didn't. Whereas I understood Reds enough to be thinking philosophically about it and understanding that film could do that. That movie has the greatest, this is not one of the questions, this is a fill-in question. <laughs> that movie has the greatest blank in the history of movies, what? Oof. Um, I'm thinking of one specific thing that I'm that I that I believe this is a fact that cannot be argued. I don't know. I don't know what that is. Hug. It's the greatest. Oh hug yeah, that is true. That, well, any movie I was ever. going to say romantically epic and yet so political. That that was what I was. Sure, but I, but, but yes, well, you're right. I mean, yeah, I like that. When they get out, when they yep. see each other on the train, when he gets off the train, that is a. And I think that's actually the moment that I was thinking about in the car. It was sort of like such an a, such a um, sophisticated tragic romance. Yeah. Wow. Um, all right. Uh, what movie did you love in high school? So I was very into Pedro Almodovar and um, Ken Russell and a bunch of like random European filmmakers. I, uh, what have I done to deserve this? It was a standout because there was something about the balance of absurdity and deep drama that I was just delighted with, that I still am delighted with, that I, 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 I feel has had a big influence on me where I was like, they're talking about the most scandalous, incredible things, but they're so completely dead serious and, and delivering it so straight. And so that was like, can't, I watched that movie a ton. And then Raising Arizona, I think is probably the movie that I've probably watched the most in my life because I think we watched it every day, like all through high school and college. Which one you get? I don't know. Nathan Jr., I think. Give me here. Oh, he's beautiful. I think I got the best one. I bet they were all beautiful. All babies are beautiful. This one's awful damn good, though. Don't you cuss around him. He's fine, he is. What's a movie you would show, uh, like, a date, somebody you were really into? Um, uh, I it would be I Know Where I'm Going, the Powell and Pressburger film, because I it's the most romantic film I've ever seen. And I don't, I can never put my finger on why. I think about it a lot because I always say, what is it about that story? What is it about? And I think it's about. Real quick, is that a movie you saw like because you were in college towns or did you see that? Uh, as that a, I saw a, later. On television or something. That somewhere. I saw later yeah. in adulthood. Yeah. And, and it blew me away. And I think that what it is, is that I personally am fascinated by your inability to control who you love. You fall in love with people you can't really you know, you can't decide who you fall in love with. And that, I think, is what's so powerful about it to me. It's not the the, the romantic comedy where the people hate each other. You know, it has all the, the makings of the tension and everything, but instead it's a story where 
they have collided with each other and there's nothing they can do. Like they, they, they can't, they have to face the fact that, that this is happening and they can't stop it despite whatever they want. Will you do something for me? It depends. I don't care where or when, but somewhere, sometime. Will you have the pipers play the role in that round maiden? Will you do something for me before I go away? It depends. I want you to kiss me. You know, so many people have, not, and not just in this forum, we haven't done enough of these, but, you know, have mentioned Powell Pressburger movies as movies that... that They're unbelievable. And they keeps being, everybody, they keep being different ones, right? Yeah, no, I'm not surprised, because no, very few people is it I know where I'm going. To me, it doesn't, the other films are great, but don't hold a candle to right. it. You know what I yeah. think it is about those guys? They were so modern. There's something so fresh and edgy and modern about, about, their filmmaking that is mesmerizing, you know, like, and Roger Livesey, who's in, who's in, I know where I'm going and, and Colonel Blimp and several of their films. Yeah, Matter of Life and Death, I think. Too, yeah. yeah right. he, he's, he, to me is a heartthrob. Like he's such a modern heartthrob. He's cutting right through in a kind of male lead that was not happening at that time. Just so honest and clean. What movie makes you cry without fail? What did I, I, I had a hard time with this one. I was thinking of many, um, do you cry easily? No, I don't cry all that easily. But then sometimes I surprise myself with how easily I cry. Um, Moulin Rouge, it, I find to be such a beautiful masterpiece of a film. Which which one are we talking about? The the the, the Baz Luhrmann one. Mm -hmm. And watching it this time, what was so interesting to me was it's about. It's, it's all about the campiness and the silliness in all over it, which is Baz is so good at. And in his younger film, sometimes he went so far with that that I didn't like it as much. But here in that film was the first time I felt like he deftly rode that, rode that, rode that, rode that, and then opens up in these certain songs through the door of, 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 of Ewan McGregor into this incredible earnesty that is so beautifully done that it just is evocative of all love, all kinds of love and tragedy and loss. And then shortly thereafter, Nicole Kidman, who's resisting it, she opens up into it. And so what I was amazed by watching it with my son is that we're watching this movie, I'm showing it to him. And then as soon as those songs start, I just start crying and I cry through the whole song. And my son is looking at me saying, what the hell, what the hell is wrong with you? And I'm like, I don't know. It's the, it's the setup and release is so good. So that's the other one that like, I don't have any control over. What filmmaker of the past uh, would you think, hey, let's go, uh, let's make a movie together? So Powell and Pressburger, just because I would be so interested in how they were making films versus everybody else in that period of time, because they were, they were obviously incredibly daring and avant-garde and pulling off such avant-garde films in a time that was much harder to do so. Um, so just like I would love to get the flavor of them and how they did it, but Charlie Kaufman it now, because of the fact that Charlie, I don't, I, 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 I would love to make films that say even more complex emotional things. And many of the things I want to make films about are go into the realm of quantum physics and, and, and all kinds of philosophical, spiritual things that you really, it's harder to do with a straightforward movie. So I'm always fascinated by that kind of mind that, that is not how I not automatically go, go to things. So the fact that he really knows how to do something that I don't know how to do well, I would be fascinated to collaborate. Charlie Kaufman, one of a number of surprising answers. <laughs> uh, uh, Okay, there's a vast warehouse where all movie props are kept. Uh, what would you, uh, when you break into that place, what would you steal? I would steal the red balloon from the red balloon. Yeah. Because that movie, I think, is, I think it's on my screensaver here somewhere. It, 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 I think, is such a masterpiece. I loved that short film so much. And it, to me, it's funny, the, the name of my company is Wishes Pictures. And that I named the company based on a guy in a dog run who had this gigantic, terrifying looking dog that was the least scary dog of all time. It was just super dopey. And he had an accent and he kept trying to convince me, no, he looks dopey, but he's vicious. And I was like, <laughs> and you couldn't tell if he was saying wishes or vicious. And so to me, the red balloon is, is, is the beginning 
of of a flavor of film, which is my favorite flavor and my greatest endeavor, which is to make very things with great magic and fairy tale, but in a very gritty reality. And Monster was was more, def you can see it more clearly in that than the Wonder Woman films, even though I tried to do that same thing in the Wonder Woman films, have no man's land where you're dealing, you're sitting in the grit, but you're also telling this fairy tale love story. That to me is the greatest pocket of filmmaking that I'm interested in doing. What was your mom's favorite movie? My mom's favorite movie was Charade, which I was, what would you say? She switched. Bridge over the River Kwai. Ah, Bridge Over the River Kwai. Well, I, see, that's good because I've seen Bridge Over the River Kwai and I was horrified when my mom said charade and I was like, I have never seen charade. Um, <laughs> have you still never seen charade? No, I've oh, never it's... seen charade. I love the, but I, this is why I love collecting people's top 10 movies because there's always like egregious misses course, that you yeah. forget that you haven't seen. And so that I have to see charade now. Um, but Bridge, Bridge Over the River Kwai. There you go. All right, all right. But Charade, also a, also a good one. Uh, 1957, my favorite year in movies, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, what was your, what was your father's favorite movie? I do not know, because my father passed away when I was seven. So my answer would be uh, my grandmother's favorite movie, which which had a profound His effect mom. on me. No, my, my, my mother's mother, uh -huh. who my mom's mom did not have a sophisticated taste in film and was, a, you know, was not somebody I would associate with that. And I asked her probably in my 20s what her favorite film was. And she said, the best years of our lives. And I remember saying, oh, that's sweet. I'll watch it because you said that. And then I was so blown away by what a masterpiece and how incredibly, I thought that that kind of filmmaking was invented later at that time. Like yeah. I didn't think anybody was having that honest of a conversation about war. It's terrible when you see a guy like you that had to sacrifice himself. And for what? And for what? I don't get you, mister. We let ourselves get sold down the river. We were pushed into war. Sure, by the Japs and the Nazis, so we oh, had... Oh, the Germans and the Japs had nothing against us. They just wanted to fight the Limeys and the Reds. And they would have whipped them, too. We didn't get deceived into it by a bunch of radicals in Washington. What are you talking about? Just read the facts, my friend. Find out for yourself why you had to lose your hands. And then go out and do something about it. You know, I don't want to tread on difficult fan, but you never asked your mom, like, what movies your dad liked? I don't even know if she would know the answer. Yeah. yeah. Can I speak? Yeah, yeah, you could speak. We were all overseas almost the whole time I was married to him, and it wasn't easy to see films. So I do remember we saw... I know all of his favorite records, but... Dr. You know. Zhivago in Germany, but I don't... I don't know. I didn't think she would know. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, because I don't think he was, he was watching film. I mean, he was in the service from the time he was in 18. I don't think that's what yeah. they were doing. Yeah. Uh, who was your dad? My dad was a fighter pilot. What was uh, his name? Well, uh, Bill Jenkins, William Jenkins. People called him what? Captain William T. Jenkins. They called him Bill. Bill, not Jenks. Billy. Jenks? They, they called him Jenks. That was his nickname. That was his call sign. Not everybody has a call sign that's their last name. I always enjoy that a lot of people call me Jenks now. And so, uh, and, and keep that carrying forward. And when I flew in a F-15 F at um, Nellis Air Force Base, they, they painted Jenks on the, on the side for, for me and my dad. That's pretty nice. It was pretty great. Um, Patty, uh, uh, this has been great. Thank you very this much. This has been so great. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so honored and delighted to be here. I really enjoyed that conversation. I hope you did too. Thanks again to Patty and to her mom. Hoping Patty watched Charade after we were done talking. As for me, Patty inspired me to watch Reds again. And if I'm honest, a handful of old Journey music videos. I'm a betting man, and after listening to that conversation, I'd bet good money that at least 65% of you Googled, what's Steve Perry doing now? You can find many of the movies we talked about on the streaming service Max. We made a list for you. It's in our show notes. James Kim produces and edits Talking Pictures. Dory Stegman books the show. Glenn Matullo mixes each episode. Thanks to Phil Richards, Jaco Friedman, Julie Baton, Katie Daniels, and Emma Morris. Angela Carone is our executive producer. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt and Allison Cohen from the Max podcast team. And as always, to Charlie Tavish from TCM. See you next time.